Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 233. You shouldn't dream your film. You shouldn't make it. Steven Spielberg. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's episode is brought to you by Blackbox. Blackbox is a new platform and community that is all about financial freedom for filmmakers like you. If you join Blackbox, you will be transformed from being a worker to being a maker of your own content. And you'll be making steady passive income from the global market. Blackbox currently allows you to upload your stock footage once, get it to many global agencies, and then allows you to share that passive income stream with your collaborators. Whether you want to submit old footage that's been sitting around in your hard drives or create brand new content, Blackbox is for you. It's really quite revolutionary. With Blackbox, filmmakers can concentrate on making great content while Blackbox takes care of all the business BS. Just visit www.blackbox.global to find out more. Today's show is also sponsored by Studio Unknown. Studio Known is a crack team of audio post professionals known for quality sound on any indie budget. Whether you need a lush surround sound mix or a quick festival submission pass, Studio Known can help you with all of your post sound needs, from sound design and mix to Foley ADR and even a custom score. Contact Studio Known and mention the Indie Film Also podcast, and you'll get 50% off one day of ADR or 10% off your complete post sound package. Just go to studiounknown.com. So guys, today's guest is Jeff Goins, and Jeff is the author of an amazing book called Real Artists Don't Starve. And I read the book, and it man, it really just just rung so true to me and what I'm trying to do here at Indie Film Hustle, how I'm trying to show you guys how to survive and thrive in the film business and that you don't have to be a broke, starving artist. That is a very old mentality. In today's world, you have to be able to make money doing your art. And that's what I try to do here at the podcast and on the blog and all the other places I'm at to try to show you to do that. And Jeff's book is awesome. It really kind of hones in on this mentality, on this thought process. And I needed to have Jeff on the show so he can share with you tips and techniques on how you can monetize your art, how you can build a career around your art, around your films, around your writing whatever you want. And he is also the best-selling author of The Art of Work as well, which is another amazing book, which we'll talk a little bit about as well. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with author Jeff Goins. I'd like to welcome to the show Jeff Goins, man. Thank you so much for being on the show. Hey, Alex. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm a huge fan of your book, uh, Real Artists Don't Starve, and I wanted you to come in and talk to the tribe because uh, I think it's something that uh, it's a message that a lot of filmmakers and artists uh, around the world need to hear because of this whole myth of the starving artist. Artist, can you talk a little bit, discuss a little bit about that myth and and how wrong it could it actually is? Yeah. So a myth is a story that we tell ourselves to help us make sense of the world around us. So there are religious myths, there are political myths. Uh, there are cultural myths, and the myth of the starving artist is a story that creative people have told themselves for hundreds of years uh, to try to make sense of the reason why it sometimes feels difficult to sell your art. And I want to debunk this myth because I think it no longer serves creative professionals. I think it actually hurts your work. And because I think we live in this age where creative success is not only possible, it's probable as long as you're willing to actually do the work. I think we live uh, in the uh, era of greatest opportunity for creative people to succeed today. But uh, in order to do that, you have to stop telling yourself this story, which is there's no money in art. You can't make any money off of you know, whatever it is, writing uh, films, films <laughs> <laughs> you name it. And I mean, it's really interesting because you can go into almost any industry and you're going to find two groups of people, uh, thriving artists and starving artists. And the starving artists are saying, well, you can't make any money off of blank, whatever it is. Uh, again, writing, uh, storytelling art, you name it. And, um, 
and while those people are saying that, there is always a group of folks who are thriving at it by simply applying, uh, you know, certain uh, certain principles, smart business tactics, which I talk about in the book, mm -hmm. uh, to help them succeed. So I believe that being a starving artist today is a choice, not a necessary condition of doing your creative work. Now, can you discuss some of those uh, business principles? Yeah. So in the book, um, basically what I did was I interviewed hundreds of thriving creative professionals today from various industries, from uh, theater to film to um, uh, writing, uh, visual arts, cartoonists, uh, dancers, you name it. And basically asked a question, like, what do these people have in common? Because obviously – um, not every person's success is identical to another person's, but if you read enough biographies, follow enough stories of people who have succeeded with their art, you tend to start seeing s some similarities. At least this was my hope. And what emerged from that experience of talking to all these people, reading all these biographies, studying 500 years of history, particularly uh, folks in the arts, mm -hmm. and seeing what did they do to succeed. And I identified 12 principles. Uh, I call them the 12 rules of the new renaissance. Mm -hmm. And it turns out these 12 things that thriving artists do to succeed are 12 things that most starving artists actually avoid or don't believe uh, they need to do. So these are things like well, the first rule is um, the – uh, is the idea of uh, the rule of recreation, that at any point you get to decide what you want to be and what you want to do. You get to change paths in life. And this is debunking this idea that you're just born with it, right? You're just mm -hmm. born with taste or uh, an artistic ability or the ability to tell a story. It's not true. Uh, you're not you're not born. Uh, I like what Seth Godin says about this. We're all just born pooping in our diapers. Like we're <laughs> we're all just, we all start at the same place. An environment can shape us. And yes, I don't disagree that uh, genetics can come you know come to play in certain physical or athletic activities. Uh, but if you want to be an artist, if you want to create for a living, if you want to tell stories, you want to make something that's going to connect with people's hearts, uh, I don't care if you you were born doing this or this is something you decide at 20 years old, 40 years old, 60 years old, uh, you have the ability to do that. So that's one of the things that, you know, a couple others is the idea of marketing. Most creative people mm -hmm. I know want to work on their art. They don't want to <laughs> have to market their work. Yep. And I think a thriving artist does this in a really smart way where they're not like putting – uh, flyers, you know, all around town saying artist for hire. <laughs> You're not just going to, right. uh, cocktail parties, throwing out, you know, your, um, uh, business card that says filmmaker like this basically leads to nothing other than you getting a really bad reputation. Uh, but what I do think works is, uh, what I call practicing in public. And this is one of the rules. This is the smart way for an artist, a creator today to market their work. So on one hand, uh, you can't just make the work and let the work speak for itself, which is what we all want to do. I get mm -hmm. that. It doesn't work exactly that way. What thriving artists do, however, is is they're not just like walking around, uh, you know, with a megaphone saying, "Hey, look at me." It's sort of a blend of of the two, and I call it practicing in public. And so, what that means is. You are doing your work and then you are sharing your work in very specific channels where it has a likelihood to succeed. So if you're a writer, that may mean that you're blogging or writing for a popular column. If you're a visual artist, it probably means that you're sharing works in progress on Instagram. Uh, and, and it's very important that whatever you whatever your practice is, that you do it on a regular, ideally daily basis so that you are producing a lot of work, you're putting it out there. And again, this is just like snippets of your work. You're not like mm -hmm. writing a movie script and, you know, giving it away for free, uh, but you are sharing, uh, your, your stuff. And, and what you're doing is you're demonstrating your competency. And, and if you're good, you're also building an audience in the process, which eventually allows you the opportunity to, uh, you know, obviously make money at some point. Uh, and then, you know, I, I would say another uh, rule that artists struggle with 
is the idea of working for free, which is like this is sort of the uh, other side, the corollary to practicing in public, which is like you're doing that for free. But mm-hmm. you're marketing. Lots of people pay to market. You're basically finding creative ways to do work, which you love doing, and then giving it away in certain channels uh, where it is much more likely that you're going to find an audience and, and it's going to help the work succeed. Um, but uh, on the other hand, you don't want to set a precedent that your work doesn't have any value. So Practicing in public means giving away little pieces of your work in different places where people, you know, are getting sort of a free sample. They can get a taste of it and go, okay, I want to find out more. Uh, like I have a friend who's a filmmaker, and um, he does these little like thirty second clips on Instagram where um, he's actually not sh- he's not um, sharing, you know, like the documentary or whatever that he's working on. Uh, typically, he's like doing some fun thing. Like one day he. Um, uh, did uh, like a, a 30 seconds overview of his day mm-hmm. and and he followed his wife around and just did these like quick like two to three second clips and told a story about you know the, the, a day in the life of uh, him and his wife and it but it's, it was like really cool and it was done really well and so obviously if you're watching this you're going well if he can do that you know, with just an ordinary, uh, you know, day in the life, what can he do with, you know, X, Y, or Z, that sort of that idea. Mm-hmm. And, but, you know, like it would be a bad idea for him to do free gig after free gig after free gig. And this right. is like really bad advice that I hear today. You just have to work, do a bunch of work for free and then you get noticed and then eventually people will pay you. And that's just not true. And most of the thriving artists I talked to um, had a very, strict rule that they very rarely um uh did work for free and and if they did it they were being charitable you know they were doing it for a nonprofit or a cause that they believed in they weren't like doing it as the norm uh, expecting to like that it would eventually get it would lead to some sort of paid work. So now, those, are, those are three things. Yeah. So with the with the whole working for free thing cuz a lot of in our industry in the film industry um there is a lot of that working for free because you're not working as an artist yet you're you're basically trying to get into the business you're trying to learn the different aspects of the business because filmmaking is is a combination of many arts all put right. together so and many crafts um so you learn almost like a either a apprenticeship uh, or by just learning by watching and doing and I, and I always advocate like when you're starting out Get on as many sets as you can. If you have to work for free, work for free for a little bit. But you're not creating for free. You're just kind of right. watching for free and, and 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 giving of your time for free. And that way, you do make those connections and you do learn. Is that I because I, I completely agree with you. I'm like, don't start making movies and giving them away for free constantly because then you're going to devalue yourself as an artist. But do you agree that learning as much as you can and sometimes doing that for free? Not for years, but for a little while, at least to get your foot in the door is, is not a bad idea. I totally agree. And, and it is like a, is a weird thing. And, and like it, it can sound sort of like a contradiction, mm-hmm. but um, like rule number three is apprentice under a master. Mm-hmm. So it, the idea is in, in the book, you start out, you're not born this way, you, but it's a decision. Like you choose to be an artist and it's, it's a decision. And I would, you know, put filmmakers in the artist category. Like you're, <laughs> yeah. cre- you're creating art, you're creating stuff that is going to change and move and impact people in hopefully, you know, transformative ways. And so this is a choice and you have to keep working on it. Um, but if you think that you're going to arrive on the scene, just awesome the way you are practicing in your basement or on your laptop you're kidding yourself as you know as, as your sn- snickers uh, indicate alex mm-hmm. um you've got to find out what it actually takes to be a professional and reading a book listening to a podcast watching a bunch of youtube clips is a poor substitute for putting yourself uh, under the mantle of somebody who has mastered your craft and so I absolutely am a big fan of apprenticeship. And apprenticeship, you know, in the Renaissance and in the Middle Ages did take years. And that's different from working as a professional and doing lots of gigs mm-hmm. for free. And, and I like the apprenticeship model of basically seven years, you were an apprentice. That means you're a student. This is your education. Mm-hmm. Many apprentices paid to get an apprenticeship, oh, just God, like, yeah. you know, 
we paid to go to university or film school or art school or whatever. Um, so if you can get a gig, not an internship where you're like fetching donuts, like you actually get to sit in the room and and see the sausage being made mm-hmm. and, and, and get to eventually hopefully participate in some of that process, that's incredibly valuable. And so I tell people when we're talking about not working for free, the goal here is to always work for something. Right. And so the problem, Alex, is, you know, if you're whatever screenwriter, right, Mm -hmm. because that's a very competitive field where everybody's sort of undercutting each other and and it can get really cutthroat and hard to make a living. Um, And you're writing all these, you know, treatments or whatever and and not getting compensated uh, for them. And you're doing this, you know, for years and you're a professional and 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 you're just doing lots of gigs for free hope and somebody's saying well this is a good opportunity right this is going to lead to something mm-hmm. else i talked to stephen pressfield about that who you know used to work in hollywood as a screenwriter mm-hmm. and he says opportunities are bullshit he says um i've never uh, like, like I'm sure these things happen, you know, once in a while, but I've never done a gig for free where somebody said it's going to be a great opportunity and it's led to anything. And so my <laughs> encouragement to people, yes. it, and, and like, look, like there's, there's always that one story, right? Yeah, you of know, course, of course, no, but you're right. Where, anytime, anytime that someone walks up is like, Hey, this is a really great opportunity. This is going to lead. If you do this one for free, <laughs> Then you're, you know, we've got four other ones lined up. I've I've fallen for that a few times early on in my career, and now you know on the post side, you just like look, uh, look, I I can't do it for free, guys. You know, I I don't need any more things on my reel. But but yeah, it it never generally. I don't think there's ever been one of those sales pitches that ever panned out. Yeah, and I mean, what they're saying is, I don't have a budget, right? Like that's what they're really saying, and like this could be big, which is true for any creative project ever, but there's no guarantee that it is going to be big. And Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like the story of, you know, the guy who says, um, you know, build your parachute on the way down. Like that's essentially what you're saying Mm -hmm. It is, you know, Hey, like just jump out the airplane and build your parachute on the way down. And the one guy who survived, uh, you know, goes, Hey, I I made it. You can make it too. And that's because you don't hear from the 99 other dead guys. Right. (laughs) Right. And and that's what this is like. It's like, do it for free and it'll lead to something and you're hearing from the one guy who didn't die. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not saying you've got to be a jerk or you've got to be too big for your britches. If you're brand new in an industry, you should be humble. You should be apprenticing under different people, learning from them. And that should honestly be an attitude that you carry throughout your career. But don't set a precedent that your work is worth nothing. And so I, you know, I do this with speaking. There's some events where they want you to come in and speak for free. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I've done the thing where they go, hey, you know, hey, we want you to speak for free. And early on, I was just go, yeah, that's great. That's great. I'd get my message out there. But I had no way of actually quantifying mm-hmm. what is this actually doing for me. Mm-hmm. And uh, a friend of mine is a well-known speaker used to uh, tour with Ray Charles. He was the opening comedian for Ray Charles. Okay. And uh, yeah, has crazy stories. And he was like, stop doing gigs for free. And I was like, but this and that. He goes, no, stop working for free. They can afford something. And I was like, no, they have no budget. He goes, trust me, they can afford something. He goes, so just at a low price. doesn't have to be a lot, but just set some price that like – your wife will actually allow you to go travel for this. And I remember, uh, you know, I, like, and so I think that's a pretty good rule of thumb early on is you've got a low price and a high price. If you, you know, have some, you can sort of say, hey, this is what I'm worth. But if you really want the gig or you're just trying to get some work, you can, you know, say, hey, this is as long as I'm willing to go. But having this bottom, you know, number that, you, that you're willing to turn work away uh, you know, for, if you don't get it for me, that was like 500 bucks. And, um, and, and, uh, it was, like, I know that if I get a check for 500 bucks plus travel and lodging, like that's, that's, you know, like that's a good, good day. And, um, and so or, I don't know, I, like people would call me and say, Hey, can you speak at this event? And I would say, um, uh, do you have a budget? They say, no, we have no budget. I said, okay, well, you know, normally, and I would quote my high price, I'd like, you know, I'll try to get, you know, a thousand bucks, but I really can't do it for less than hundred. And first time I did this, Alex, somebody said, Oh, well, yeah, we can do that. Yeah. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what? You have no budget. So there is that thing where 
you want to have no budget, they kind of do have a budget. Uh, the market is always willing to sustain more than you think it can. The other thing is just because they can't pay you doesn't mean that the gig isn't worth doing if you can get something out of it. So remember, the idea here is you always have to work for something. So if somebody wants you to do a gig for free and you really want to do it and it's fun and you're like trying to build your portfolio, cool. But maybe you say, hey, I, like as a rule, I don't work for free, but maybe we can negotiate something else out. Uh, you know, I give this and you whatever, you know, like mm -hmm. give me something for web, you know, maybe you're doing a, a, a small film project and somebody is a web designer and they can design your website for you. And so, you know, now you're giving several thousand dollars worth of value to them and, and they're compensating with several thousand dollars worth of value. There's something or maybe you're just going, hey, I'll do this, but I need five referrals. Right. And mm -hmm. you can't tell them that I did this for free. I have a friend who's a photographer who occasionally does that. He'll do a gig with like a very influential. Uh, musician or whatever uh, here in Nashville, and he'll do it for free because uh, he knows you know they could pay him you know a few thousand bucks or whatever for his day rate, but he knows that, it, that it'd be more valuable to get five referrals to you know his his friends where it can be you know fifteen or twenty thousand dollars in values. So I'm not opposed to not like to you occasionally not getting paid for your work mm -hmm. as long as you're getting something of actual real measurable value out of it but just i mean like this surprised me i spoke with hundreds of writers filmmakers dancers uh creative entrepreneurs and they did not do their work for free. There was a study I, I mentioned in the book where it contrasts unpaid internships and paid internships. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, they followed thousands of college graduates. And if you had an unpaid internship, mm -hmm. even if you had a few of them, mm -hmm. uh, you were half as likely for that, that internship to lead to paid work. And so something like 30% of unpaid internships led to jobs after college, whereas paid internships, it was like 62%. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we l listen to this and we go, well, yeah, that makes sense. You know, if you, if you set a precedent that you're not getting paid, they don't want to start paying you. That, that makes sense. And yet, like, we continue to go into situations not getting paid, thinking it's going to lead to paid work. And if you do – um, do work for free because you want to be generous. Mm -hmm. Do it because you want to be generous, not because you're expecting it to lead to a paycheck. And, and don't be mad when it doesn't lead to something like that. A perfect example on, on in my world, when I was first starting out in, in music videos, uh, someone came to me with a Snoop Dogg music video. And they ah. said, look, we have no money. I'm like, I'll do it. I'll color it for free. Yeah, um, right. because it's Snoop Dogg, and I plastered yeah. Snoop Dogg's face everywhere on my reel, yeah. on my website, and it led to thousands upon thousands, tens of thousands of dollars worth yeah. of work by doing a day of work for free. Yeah. And that's not working for free, Alex. Yeah. That's, that's trading, mm -hmm. uh, your time for reputation, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they could have said, no, you can't, you can't put this on your reel. You can't talk yeah, about no. this at which point they would have been screwing you. Yes, of course, of course. But I, so, was, I, mean, I made yeah. sure that was clear on the way in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so like, that's a great example of we don't have money, but yeah, you can tell people that you did that. And it's a risk, and I'm not opposed to taking risks. Mm -hmm. But gosh, I know so many creatives who have made a habit of giving away their work as a rule mm -hmm. for free mm -hmm. most of the time. And they've been doing it for two, three, four years waiting for their big break and they are destroying their break, you know? Exactly. It would, just, it would just be better to charge a little bit of money. Like Even I talked to an artist, a visual artist who started, went from zero to $20 per print. She was selling prints and that was huge for her. Cause now she could go, go from 20 to 50, 50 to a hundred, a hundred to a thousand and so on. The gap between zero and one is exponentially greater than the gap from one to two. So you don't have to like go in, uh, guns blazing, saying, you know, I'm worth all this money. You just need to get paid for your time. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be minimum wage sometimes. <laughs> you know, yeah. just yeah. It, it, when you're starting out, it is what it is. Now, yeah, you just start, you just start low. And then over time, you can start raising it. Like that $500 speaking rate is now $15,000, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, but going from zero to a few hundred bucks, mm -hmm. um, like that was huge for mm -hmm. me, but it did start setting a precedent that I value it. And I think the idea here, the principle here is nobody's going to value your work until you do. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Without question. Now, one, th one thing I want to talk to you about is this, 
this kind of virus uh, <laughs> that's in artists <laughs> in artists' heads of always trying to be 100% original and yeah. being afraid of stealing art from someone else or, or or anything like that. And I've tried to debunk this a bunch of times, but I really want to hear what you have to say about it. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a quote by a guy named uh, Will Durant. He's a historian. He says, nothing is new except arrangement. And and so it's the idea that like we're all we all have the same source material, the same ideas. You know, there's the Joseph Campbell monomyth idea. There's only one story, the hero's journey, and we're just all retelling it in different ways. The hero with a thousand faces kind of sure. thing. And um, I think this is true in creative work. Uh, Michael Caine, the actor, said you have to steal. You have to steal everything you see. So creativity is not so much about coming up with an original idea as it is borrowing from other people's ideas, rearranging them and saying, here, look what I made. I mean I think a filmmaker who is uh, like the best at this in the like <laughs> – I know who you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know who you're going to say too. <laughs> It's Quentin Tarantino. Yeah, so yeah. Of, course, of course. And it, and he's like, uh, like unabashed about it, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, and it's, I mean, it's fascinating when you whatever you know, watch Reservoir Dogs or Pulp Fiction, uh, or you know, The Hateful Eight, and he is like totally intentionally ripping off all of his heroes, and he and it's an homage, like he's he's giving credit to the the films and the people that he loved. But you know, it's interesting about like the average moviegoer, I'm guessing, uh, looks at Quentin Tarantino's films and goes, oh, isn't that interesting? Isn't that original? Mm -hmm. And he's like, no, what are you talking about? You know, it's not original. It is the opposite of original. Um, but that's what we're all doing from music to film to literature. We are all building on the work that has come before us. And hopefully we're borrowing from enough different sources that as we recombine these elements and rearrange them and reinterpret them, what we're coming up with is our remix, our understanding of that story, that idea. And people look at it and they don't see all that. They don't, they don't see the work that went into it. They go, wow, isn't that interesting? And if you don't do that, because I think people think, well, I, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to create something original. If you don't do that, what ends up happening is you create something ironically that looks really derivative where you subconsciously borrowed something from one person and you wrote that song, you made that movie, you wrote that book, and, and, it, and, it, and it feels flat, right? Because when you aren't trying to steal, you end up becoming a copycat. And it's better to be a thief than it is to be a copycat. And, and I think there's a big difference between that. I think the audience really should understand is that being a hack – and being on a tour uh, is different. The, the big difference to that, in my opinion, is being a hack. You copy from one source. Okay. So, and then if you're on a tour or you're paying homage, you copy from multiple sources and you rearrange them. And that's the big difference between literally being a hack, where you just copy something and literally just repaste it with a couple of changed elements and and changing it from multiple different sources. And then one of the best examples of what you're talking about, um, I'm assuming you saw the movie Point Break? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The original, yeah. not not yeah. not yeah. not whatever they came out with recently. <laughs> the the, yeah. the original. I saw both of them, actually. Did yeah. you see? Did you, it was horrible, wasn't it? <laughs> the second one. Yeah. Well, yeah. It got really good uh, like reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. And I was like, <laughs> and I was on a plane. I was like, <laughs> sure, why not? Okay, but I was like, how can you like remake a movie with uh, Keanu Reeves Patrick's and Patrick? It's Swayze. iconic. It's an iconic movie. Yeah, but I mean, it's almost a caricature unto itself, you know? Right, because you can't. Like, they they, they just, remade it seriously, you know? Which you can't. Like, <laughs> you can't do that. Like when they like like when they did like Baywatch as like an R-rated movie. Yeah. With you know Dwayne Johnson, I was like, okay, cool. Like they're having fun with it and they're doing something different. When they remade, yeah, it was it was kind of fell flat. It was okay. But if you see, but if you see Point Break, Point yeah. Break, uh, there was a movie in a multi billion dollar franchise that stole Point Break. I mean, beat for beat, which is Fast and Furious. Oh yeah, you replace the surfers with car racers, and it's the exact. <laughs> Same story. FBI agent infiltrates, yeah. gets involved with the girl. The girl's his boy. It's it's the same story, and they become friends at the end. And they don't want to. It's 
It's the same story. It's the exact same story. But look, it was done in a – it was rearranged. It was rearranged in a completely new way. Um, could you argue that it was <laughs> stolen almost beat for beat? Sure. But that's Hollywood. So, you know, another example of this is – and it really – like I love that. And and I do, I do this all the time with movies. And I'm like, guys, don't you know what's going on here? Mm-hmm. Uh, like when I went to see the movie Cars, the Pixar movie. Sure. Uh, do you know, you know, you know what I'm talking about? No, I don't, I, of- no, I don't actually. I'm, I'm very interested. <laughs> okay. So you go see cars. Cars is a story of a hot shot, um, you know, race car, young kid who's from the big city and then he's out going to his next race. He's driving cross country and, uh, he, in the middle of the night crashes his car into, uh, somebody's fence and, um, you know, and then the next day he wakes up and he's in jail and, um, uh, you know, the guy who, um, you know, crashed into his fence, uh, is, is the, you know, town sheriff and he's the judge and he's, you know, sentencing him to, um, you know, community service and he's got to rebuild the road that he's messed up in the fence and all that. It's my cousin Vinny. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> there was a movie, uh-huh. uh, in the nineties, I think with Michael J. Fox called my Doc s- Hollywood. Oh my God, it is Doc, Doc Hollywood. Hollywood is the story <laughs> of a Hollywood plastic surgeon yes. who's driving cross country for yes. some big promotion or something that he's doing. Uh, and in the middle of the night, he wrecks his car, drives through a fence, and the guy whose fence he wrecks <laughs> is also the town judge and sheriff, and he's a doctor too, and and he sentences him to community service where he's got to uh, you know, be a doctor in a small town. And it is the same story. By the end of the movie, you've got this hotshot kid who adopts these small town values and goes back to the big city and then realizes, you know, uh, he's got a love interest, all these things. And, he, and he's got the mentor who's the, the older guy who did what he did and has mm-hmm. his own ghosts and stuff. And he has to learn from him and he leaves and then eventually comes back. It is the exact same story. Oh my God. You've just blown my mind. <laughs> you've just <laughs> blown my mind. crazy is like, I didn't hear anybody talking about this. Why? Because it's a cartoon. Because uh, they're they're talking cars. But I remember watching cars because Pixar up to that point mostly had quote unquote original stories. And I just thought it was so interesting that they were borrowed from you know some nineties romantic comedy with Michael J. Fox. And I and I am sure that was a remix of something else, and so on and so on and so on. That's amazing, but uh, they really just wanted to clarify that that you cannot yeah, be afraid totally. to re to to not it was, honestly it's steal. You steal from other art forms, other. I mean, you see artists constantly taking from paintings, and you know, and writers are taking from novels and all these kind of things. You just have to rework it and take from multiple sources and not just one, and uh, and then you can then you can create a brand new work. And also, when you do that, you also just start. Your, your own juice is flowing where you start with someone else's work and then maybe you start twisting around kind of like with filmmakers. We all want to be a Kubrick or a, a Fincher or a Spielberg or a Scorsese and we might start down that road, but then eventually you find your own voice by yeah. studying the masters. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, before – you find your, we all, we all want to be original. We all want to be somebody that somebody else copies. And I think you can do that. But I think what we forget is all of these masters, all of our heroes started out copying their heroes. Mm -hmm. So you start by copying, then you curate the influences, you rearrange them. And then ultimately you do do something creative and it, and, and it is by using all the same source material. It is by getting the skills and the techniques embedded into your, you know, muscle memory so that you're not just doing, you know, what Quentin Tarantino did, you know, uh, mimicking it. You, you have got the technique down where you understand why he did that. Mm -hmm. And once you, I mean, once you do something enough, you, you get to the why, and then you begin to make creative choices from that deep well of understanding. But at the very beginning, you know, we're all just uh, audience members and we're watching, you know, going, why did Stanley Kubrick do that? That was weird. And, you know, 2001 mm-hmm. Space Odyssey. Um, and, and, and you study it. And I don't think you really understand it until you copy it, you mimic it, you get it into your bones. And then from there, eventually you do stuff that the world dares to call original. And you're kind of going, well, this is just like, it's like when somebody asked 
uh, Bono how they got that original U2 sound, which everybody's been copying for 30 years now, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, we all we were trying to do was copy all of these bands around mm -hmm. us in the you know 80s, right, right. Uh, a lot of hair bands and stuff, and we just weren't that good. We weren't good enough to play guitar solos like that and, you know, and shred like that. And so the edge would like turn up the delay and, you know, do it this way. He says, so we were trying to copy everybody around us. We weren't that good. And this is what came out. Obviously, 30 years later, how long it's been. He's, he, they're one of the few that they're, they're still remembered. <laughs> yeah. And they're very intentionally doing those things that at the time were just improvisations, just what we could pull off right now. I mean, it's like the story of Kevin Smith when, you know, he, he does clerks for like $10,000 and he gets all of his friends from film school to volunteer, mm -hmm. you know, to, to be in the film. It takes 19 days. His parents take out a $3,000, uh, you know, uh, equity line of credit out of their mortgage and he makes it, you know, and it has that, and it's raw and rough and, and it, ha but it has that kind of iconic Kevin Smith feel and it becomes, you know, it wins, uh, it goes to Sundance and, and then every film after that, he has a much larger budget but he realized that there were certain things from those constraints and copying from these different influences that people really liked. And so eventually you you realize, well, like, I want to continue some of these things that maybe at the time were me just doing my best to copy the people who came before me. And in fact, the way that I did it actually produced something original. Absolutely. And can you talk, you talk a little bit about in your book about owning your work. Can you elaborate a little bit about that? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it, it is what it sounds like. It is the idea that, um, most creative people sell out too soon. And I'm not opposed to selling out in the sense that you let somebody else acquire your intellectual property. Mm -hmm. uh, I've done this with books. I've done this with, you know, a, a number of projects. Uh, but you need to understand that if you are spending, hundreds of hours or years of your life creating a piece of IP and and then you sell it to the first bidder. First of all, the first bidder is going to be the lowest typically. <laughs> um, you no longer control that work and you no longer, uh, depending on the agreement, uh, get paid for that. And um, writers do this a, a lot with uh, film options. And, where books, and books as well. Yeah, and books as well. Um, and a great example of this, an exception to the rule of B.J.K. Rowling, who um, a lot of people don't know this, but Disney wanted to acquire the film rights uh, for Harry Potter. And uh, she turned them down because she wanted like a 1% uh, royalty uh, for all the films. And they're like, we're, we're not doing that. That's insane. And it is, it is not typical either. Mm -hmm. And she said, okay. And, and Universal was like, we'll do that deal. And that one decision made her a billionaire. Uh, similar story um, with you know the guys who uh, started Pixar, where um, you know very early on they were uh, Disney came along and said, hey, you know we like what what you're doing, and it began with John Lasseter, who actually was fired from Disney, mm -hmm. left, joined George Lucas, uh, it was Steve Jobs, you know, and uh, Lucas Lucas sold Pixar to Steve Jobs and. And Lasser was, you know, working with these people at Pixar, and it was basically a computer company, not a film company. And they're like, well, maybe we can make some films with this. They ended up, you know, winning a short film uh, award, uh, an Oscar, I think. And um, and then Disney goes, well, hey, wait, 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 we want you back. And they were going to triple his salary. They're going to bring John back because they understood his ideas are actually good. <laughs> we need good ideas <laughs> right. right now. Right. And he turned them down. And, um, and so they continued to make their films and Disney came in and said, Hey, we like, we want to be a part of this. And they, and, and they started helping fund uh, toy story and, and, it, and they started to lose control of the work. And, and if you've ever seen, you know, any of the behind the scenes documentaries mm -hmm. about Pixar, like pick, like toy story reached a point where it was really, really bad and nobody liked it. And it was because they were losing ownership of the project and they eventually had to say, okay, we have to own this, um, uh, you, you know, like we really have to own this process and make the story what we believe it is. And, uh, you know, obviously eventually Pixar, you know, sold to Disney for billions of dollars, but they just kept resisting, uh, these early opportunities. Um, and you can, I mean, they talk about this in the book creativity Inc mm -hmm. where people wanted to come in 
and and buy the company. And they just kept saying no, no, no. And so you, if you have an idea, you have a story of some art that you want to share with the world. Understand that nobody cares more about that work. If it's if it's your work, it's your intellectual property that you've created. Nobody cares about it and understands it better than you. I'm not opposed to you selling a book or a film or a company to the right buyer. But understand, as soon as that transaction is done, you do not get to speak into that. And you don't. It, you should plan on not making another dime uh, off of it. And so, what we find is starving artists tend to sell their work off quickly. You want this? You want this movie script? You you want my services? You want this? You want that? There you go. You create something and then you sell it and you make a quick. Um, you know, you get a quick payback and then they go and, you know, you, maybe they, they paid you five grand for this. They go make hundreds of thousands of dollars off of that and you get mad about it. You shouldn't be mad about it. Like you understood that you were giving up your rights to that. But also understand that when you sell out too soon, you don't get to influence anymore. And uh, this is what really drove Lassiter is was the end. You know, like it wasn't the money. He could have made more money at Disney. It was the idea that he was in control of the work, and Jobs gave him so much creative control, and he really helped build Pixar into what is today, you know, the storytelling um, powerhouse it is. So much that when Disney acquired them, they said, "We have to tell the stories. Like we still have to." Mm -hmm. retain this and they did so yeah i mean that's the idea and, and eventually you know it might make sense for you to sell your creative empire or your idea to somebody else uh but what starving artists do is they often do that too soon whereas thriving artists they wait 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 and they're holding out for two things one they want to make sure that um they really develop this idea as much as they possibly can into what it is george lucas is a great example of this mm -hmm. where um, it, it got to the point where he couldn't make Star Wars any better. Like I, I feel like I can say that, <laughs> you know, without being too biased. You know, it got to the point where his re retention of ownership of Star Wars was hurting the Star Wars story, and so it makes sense to sell out when it's for a lot of money. And his was, you know, whatever that was, billions of dollars. And and the person that you're selling it to, the company that you're selling it to. They can make it better. They can reach more people. They can take your vision and see it through in a better way. And so I'm not opposed to, quote, unquote, selling out. I am opposed to selling out too soon. And musicians, artists, writers, filmmakers often do this too soon, and they they regret it. And those who are making a living off of their art really resist the temptation to give away their intellectual property too quickly. Now, do you know the Shawshank Redemption story? I don't know that story. Uh -uh. So uh, Frank Darabont, uh, who's the writer uh, of that of the script, was okay. shopping it around town, and obviously everybody who read it was like, "Oh my god, this is an amazing script!" Uh, and they were offering him high seven figures, and uh, and he was starting. He, he was a TV writer, basically. He was doing TV work. He had not really done anything of any uh, anything in the film industry and in, in, in feature films yet. And when he um, when they when he said, "Look, uh, I'll I'll sell it to you, but I need to direct," and everyone's like, "No, no, you've never directed. You're not going to do oh, it." Interesting. And he decided to sell his script for two hundred fifty thousand dollars, which in the grand scope is a lot of money, but not when you're being offered high seven figures. Yeah. And he's like, "I want a directing career," and that launched him. And he was smart enough to know he didn't want to sell out. His script, because that might have been it. He might have not gotten a right. shot. There would have been no Green Mile. There would have been, uh, there possibly would have been a Walking Dead, you know, because he's the one that uh, helped create Walking wow. Dead and created what it is today. All of that based on that one decision, hey, I don't, I, I, I need to direct. And that's a great example of holding to your guns. So, you know, I've, I've made good decisions about this. I've sold off you know, books and pieces of intellectual property for pennies and, you know, been frustrated afterwards. And I don't judge anybody's decisions, you know, in terms of what you need to do to take care of yourself or your family. But I, I just think it's worth noting that the people who have uh, created uh, a body of work for a lifetime have typically made a habit of not selling out too quickly. There's that story. I don't know if you know the story, Alex, mm -hmm. about, um, Marlon Brando, where, um, uh, what is it called? Where, where like an actor gets points, like shares. Yeah, back, in a, end, yeah, back so, end points. 
Yeah, he gets yeah. back at gross points or uh, net points, God forbid, but gross points generally are back end points. Yeah, so he bas- he was in debt, right? Mm-hmm. And, and he basically he was like $100,000 in debt or something, and he sold all of his points to who have Francis Ford Coppola, I guess, uh, sold all of his points and so they could pay off this debt. And, you know, then this is for the Godfather. And then obviously it goes on to be a very successful film, Mm -hmm. uh, arguably by some of the best, you know, best film ever. Um, and those points would have been worth like, you know, 50 or a hundred million dollars today. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, <laughs> and well, he did all right because he got 7 million for Superman for 10 minutes of work. So <laughs> I, I think he did all right at the end of the yeah, day. He did. Okay. It's just an example of when, for example, when you're not managing your money, well, you can make a short term decision where you're like, mm-hmm. I just need this money right now without thinking long term. Right, exactly, exactly. Um, I'm going to ask you a few questions I ask all of my guests, uh, Jeff. Great. What cool. advice would you give uh, a filmmaker specifically wanting to break into the business today? Well, obviously, I don't know a lot about, but it's a, from coming from an artist standpoint. Sure, yeah. I think, I mean, I wish every creative person would do this one thing, and I and I and I find that in any industry, and you can speak to this better than I can, Alex. Um, there is in any creative industry, there is this, um, purity where, which is not good, like where your art is really precious. And uh, I think I would imagine this is true with filmmaking, <laughs> certainly true with music, certainly true with, um, writing where your the, the, the narrative that's going on in your head is 50 years old or 30 years old where you're going, well, Marlon Brando never had to do this. Oh God. It's like yes. that, it's a different world now even talking you know talking about jk rowling stephen king i mean these are people who you know wrote their books and you know uh started their careers pre-internet and so it's just a different world and um i think marketing is one of those things that so many creatives struggle with well how am i going to do that i can't do that and i i think the practice in public is the number one habit that i see uh, thriving creative professional state. Like that's what they're doing. So I think a very practical thing that you can do is find a way to share one piece of your work in public every single day. And so that could, you know, like I mentioned, you know, I doing uh, a short, like Instagram mini movie, right. Mm-hmm. Every single day, just to say, these are my chops and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be mass media. It doesn't have to be um, you know, billboard on Times Square. But the point is you need to be practicing every day, obviously, and you need to be sharing your work, showing your work in public so that other people can find you. Austin Kleon says, before people can find you, you have to be findable. So my challenge is do one thing every day that you can share, you know, on the internet or in some public place where people can eventually look upon, upon your work. And when they do, or when you meet people and point them to your website or your Instagram or Facebook or whatever channel you're using, they don't just see one, like one video. They don't see one about page. They see a body of work. And so when people find you, they realize that you're taking this very seriously. That's another thing I was, another piece of advice I think you could, you could, would, I think I, I can grab from that statement is that create as much as you can and constantly yes. be making work and not just stick around with, I'm going to spend five years on this one movie, uh, unless you're James Cameron, but he already has a body of work. Uh, but, uh, but generally speaking, just do as much work as you can so you could be lump, become prolific. And when someone does notice you, which they will, They'll go, oh, look, they've got five features, six features under their belt, or they've written 20 screenplays or something along those lines. Would you agree? Yeah, totally. Because first of all, you're not that good when you start, and so you want to get better faster. Uh, and then second, you know, when people do stumble upon your work, they realize you're not just a one hit wonder or a hack or a beginner. And if nothing else, Producing a body of work demonstrates a strong work ethic. I'm willing to do a bunch of stuff, uh, you know, no matter what, in a short amount of time, which I, I think communicates more than just I got lucky once or I'm <laughs> hard to work with or a prima donna or whatever. And so, yeah, I love that. It's a, it's a great idea. Now, can you tell me a book besides yours, of course, that had the biggest impact on your life or career? I'm trying to think of like a, a an artist book. Um, 
I mean, like, I, I remember a friend of mine who's a musician recommending this business book to me, Think and Grow Rich, mm-hmm. um, which I was like, you know, I don't know. You know, as a creative person, I was like, I don't know about that. But this is a musician who is a no name guy Mm -hmm. and he was making millions of dollars a year just by following a lot of the principles we talk about um, we've been talking about owning his work being smart like doing things that nobody else was doing instead of you know being one more person vying for the big two or you know the big the big Mm -hmm. deal or whatever and he says just read it you know and i read it and it really did change the way i think and i i love the quote at the beginning of the book by napoleon hill where he says thoughts are things Mm -hmm. and i think that's really true so the things that you think about have a way of coming true. And I certainly try to articulate that. And real artists don't starve. So if you think you're a starving artist, if you think you're going to starve and you're like, nobody will, will care about this, then that's probably going to come true. And, and, and if instead you go, well, I don't have to starve. I can find a way. Like there, this work has value and I'm going to find a way to uh, make this valuable to other people. Mm-hmm. That ends up coming true too. So yeah, I mean, I, I, I reluctantly – was like, okay, I read this book and I said, yeah, this makes sense. <laughs> it's an amazing book. It's it's one of my top uh, top 10 books. Yeah, it's without a great question. book. Mm-hmm. Now, what lesson took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? I think I think the lesson is life is not fair. Yeah. And and and, and it's just, I mean, like today, right? I'm dropping my kid off at school. And, um, you know, there's traffic, right? And we <laughs> left early and I don't know, you know, like nobody told me as a parent that you, you basically go back to school with your kid, right? Like mm-hmm. homework's not just his responsibility. It's my responsibility to remind him and make sure he has all his stuff in the morning. And like my life got a lot more stressful when we sent our son to kindergarten and he mm-hmm. goes to the school where if he's late, you've got to go, they lock the door and you've got to go to the office. And, mm-hmm. and I feel like I'm 12 again, you know, and like, <laughs> why are you late? And like, it was the traffic. Life is not fair. Um, so that's, that's the lesson that I've learned, but I've also learned that it doesn't matter. Like the fact that life is unfair. First of all, it's unfair to all of us. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. there is a little bit of equilibrium there. Um, but uh, the fact that it's unfair doesn't excuse you from your responsibilities and the work that you have to do. And as a writer, I spent years going, that's not fair. I'm better than them. They got lucky. They're just talented. You know, whatever. And and eventually I was just like, so? So am I just going to like sit here and excuse myself from the work that I'm supposed to do because it's harder for me, or at least it feels that way, than it is for somebody else? And um, it was around this time that I sort of adopted this little adage that I tell myself now, uh, which is, okay, like maybe some people get lucky and some people are talented, which means like they're lazy because they can just do it without even trying, which is frustrating, also not fair. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, but what can you do? And I told myself – you can outlast the lucky and you can outwork the lazy. Mm-hmm. And so anytime I feel frustrated at life's injustices, I'm like, well, what can I do? Well, I can outwork that person. I could just work harder than that person. I can do that. I mean, you don't have to be that smart to do that. Mm-hmm. And that person over there who's like killing it and, and work has worked half as long as I have and tried half as hard, maybe I'll just outlast them. Maybe I'll just keep going after they get bored. And, you know, it helps. Those are great. Those are great lessons, honestly. And last question: What are the three? What are your three of your favorite films of all time? The Godfather, mm-hmm. uh, Part One, and I have this debate like between um, Godfather Part One and Part Two, um, where I was like, I think Two is better. And then I went back. I went back and watched One. I was like, nah, No, because like Two doesn't exist without One. So I'm pretty yeah. So it's just Godfather Part <laughs> okay. One. Okay. Uh, Godfather Part One, um, Empire Strikes Back, mm-hmm. and Inception. I love that movie. I think it's a great movie. Inception is a great movie. It's a, I'm, I'm a big Nolan fan, so um, he's great. Uh, anything he does is amazing. And Jeff, where can people find your work online, and uh, and where they can find you on social media? Yeah, thanks, Alex. It was a great conversation. Uh, you can find me at my blog, my website, GoinsWriter.com. That's just my last name, G O I N S Writer.com. Goins. And, you know, I'm on all the social medias and you can find all that information at my blog. Awesome, Jeff. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your knowledge uh, with the um, and, and your and your message of hope for all starving artists and, and, and starving filmmakers out there that you don't have to be. 
starving and there is a way out. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Thanks for having me, Alex. I love the conversation. And um, yeah, I mean, I think the big takeaway is being a starving artist today is a choice. So I hope you don't choose because the world does need your work as long as you're willing to get out of your own way and do that work. I hope this episode has inspired you guys to know that you don't have to be a starving artist, that you don't have to just do your art on the side or this, that you can turn it into a business. You can make a living doing your art. And in all honesty, it is your responsibility to do your art because this world more than ever needs your voice, needs your art, whatever that art might be, whether it is directing feature films, if it's being a costume designer, a production designer, cinematographer, a screenwriter, any aspect of the film industry, but anybody listening to this that's not in the film industry, whatever art you are creating, this world needs it and you can turn it into something that makes you a living. I've been able to do it and I know you can too. If you want links to anything we talked about, including all of Jeff's books, head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 233 for the show notes. And a quick update on the new course that we just released, Indie Film Producing Masterclass with Suzanne Lyons, is selling like crazy. I cannot believe how many tribe members signed up for the early bird special and how many sales just keep happening even after the early bird special was over. It is amazing. I'm so glad you guys are liking it and enjoying it. It is, again, the best course that I've ever put out for Indie Film Hustle and for the tribe. You definitely got to check it out. If you have not yet, head over to producingmasterclass.com and check it out. And as always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 